what people are Hi everybody and uh, welcome to Nought 100. Um, we're just going to give everyone a minute or so to join us and then we will kick off. Okay, I think we've got the majority of people uh, joined us now, so we will make a start. So welcome to, I think, event, the latest event in uh, one of 12 that Answer are hosting as part of the Leeds Digital Festival. So NORTS 100, delivering COVID real-time monitoring with NHS Digital. Um, we will go into introductions in a little while, but first, I'd just like to... Um, Highlight that we do have a Slido, active Slido uh, hashtags there, 1425233. You can scan the QR code to go directly to slido.com or put that URL into your phone. But we'll be really happy to take your questions. We will leave until the end, if that's okay, but please post any questions through the event um, in response to what we're going to present. So that number will actually be on each slide thereafter. So you don't need to write it down or worry about it. Um, it will be present on the slides. So without further ado, let's go into some introductions. I'm Kay Keel, Principal Consultant and Digital, and I was part of the team delivering uh, our top monitoring. Hello, I'm Christina Grant. I'm one of the Agile project managers at Ants and Digital. I've been with the company for a couple of years, and the main project that I've been on has been uh, the IT operation center that we're going to talk about today. And over to you, Andrew. Hi, uh, I'm Andrew Kurtz. I'm a head of service at NHS Digital. I have uh, responsibility for multi million pound budgets and over 150 staff. I cover a number of services, uh, including the IT Operations Centre, which we'll talk to you about in a little while. I also cover a number of the COVID services, i.e., COVID pass, uh, vaccination, and the National Testing Service, which uh, we'll also go through today. Uh, I also cover some of the platforms and the interlinks of how you get to NHS Digital. So today we're going to go through, as you can see on the right side of this slide, setting the scene, diving in, how do you reflections, where we are now and what next. So this journey started. So setting the scene. So the journey started uh, really with a new CIO joining in NHS Digital, um, a gentleman called Pete Rose, who's sadly no longer with us. He came in and reviewed what NHS Digital had in place from a, an operations perspective as his role in CIO. And he looked at the monitoring and alerting and the various bits around that and service management uh, elements of it. Uh, he was a little frustrated and a little disappointed because what was in place was very much siloed per individual products. Uh, there was no real standards per teams for the monitoring and alerting. Uh, many different monitoring tools and processes across the organization. Uh, so it wasn't joined up and it wasn't centralized. Uh, and it wasn't particularly proactive, it was more reactive in nature. So he had a vision that uh, NHS Digital um, in the live service area really needed to be more proactive. And the vision really was around a centralised IT operations centre, uh, ranging from the areas of thinking, if you had screens very much like NASA have, you wanted all of the screens on the wall, you wanted all of the end-to-end -end journeys, monitoring and alerting in place, and he wanted all of that in one place with the team sat behind it who could then uh, monitor and work on the alerts 24 7 go down to level one level two before we needed to call anyone else out for level three and he also wanted to have clear roles responsibilities boundaries be consistent in what we did and most of all importantly uh, he wanted to be proactive and prevent the number of high threat incidents we were getting and prevent the incidents we were getting and that was the whole driver as it should be between uh, for any IT operations center uh yeah, but yeah move on, please. so we 
with that vision in place, uh, we were then drilled down into a strategy area. So it was, how do we put that together? Well, you break it down into different blocks and you create a strategy for it and deliver them. It became apparent at the same time, COVID hit, as you can see, March 2020. So these almost coincidental in timing of this vision we were given by our CIO and also then COVID hit. Well, actually, when COVID hit, there was one key thing that NHS Digital were involved in, the national testing service. That was all of your lateral flow device testing and also the PCR testing. Now, this was critical service using a number of different bits of the different suppliers, but also different bits of the NHS Digital journey that was already existing to get it in place quickly. So it was an ideal opportunity to prove that we could put an IT operation center in place and monitor end to end all the way through. Because if we didn't do that, any delays into the results from an international testing service, uh, well, if you didn't get your results, you were still out in the public at the time. And if you were out in the public, you were therefore still transmitting COVID was getting more widely spread. And therefore, we might go into lockdown. That's the theory then. Uh, we all know what happened with that one. Um, so what happened was, not only did we need the results through quickly and stop any delays in the results, i.e. be proactive and prevent any delays in the journey, but the data was also used daily by the government stand-up. So when you saw Chris Whitty and Boris Johnson stood up, that data that was used was all flowing through that route as well. So that was used for them daily uh, daily uh, meetings, can't remember what they Briefings with the briefings, probably briefings, yeah, thank you. And um, they're also used to work out whether we should lock down or not based on the prevalence and the reporting. So it was really, really key data and any delays in that could have a uh, very uh, important impact in, to the country. So that was chosen as an MVP and the first of time to do that. So we knew we needed it quick and that was the starting point. So NHS Digital put a team together, uh, which was led, by, uh, led very well and maybe by gentleman called Mike Walker and he realized quite quickly that we couldn't do this alone we needed uh, expertise so we went out to the market using the existing commercial frameworks that were in place from an energy digital perspective and we needed more resource we didn't have enough resource to do it in the first place so there was a resource element that we needed we also need specialist skills we we have some splint skills but not near enough and this wouldn't be the uh, strategic choice for NHS digital for monitoring and alerting, but nowhere near enough spun skills in house from our side. We also wanted some expertise in IT delivery, particularly agile delivery. It was something that we were doing across our organization, but we didn't have lots of expertise in them areas. So we went out to market and we answered digital won that, and that was great because. It's, uh, as we'll come through the story and we'll work through it as how it's worked. But we wanted, a, we wanted, we didn't just want a delivery partner. What we wanted was a blended team, a team that would be open, would be honest, and would collaborate together. Uh, and that was very much the approach we moved on with Anson. So, with the delivery team in place, with them short deadlines, what did we do next? Well, as you, you can see, so these are giving away a little bit of the ending of where we got to because you can see some of the monitoring in place here. But we had more than just putting the monitoring and alerting in place. So there's sort of really five key areas. First of all, we had to put the infrastructure in place. We needed the screens, we needed the sign. Secondly, we had to win hearts and minds and influence people. Now that's not just within NHS Digital, there was wider NHS and blend the bodies were interested. There were also external suppliers, as uh, Christina will go through as part of the journey. And um, so we have to win hearts and minds and also persuade people that this should be the strategic approach from NHS digital, getting all them silos into one place. We also had training elements within our own team. As I said, we didn't have enough people in new Spunk. Also the level two people who've been doing the monitoring and the learning. If they were going to do level two, they needed more skills. So there's some training elements for them. There's also a different approach to service management that we needed to put in place because we've been very much reactive up to that point. Actually, we wanted to be proactive. So there was a different uh, skill set and mindset needed for that. Overall, though, what were we doing it for and why? Well, we were delivering, uh, we wanted to deliver more resilient and higher availability for our services in NHS Digital, particularly the National Testing Service initially as a first type and an MVP. But also the users, well, actually, it was you, the general public, because you were taking the test and we were getting the results to you. But it also went to 
primary care, secondary care, who were staffing all of those places who were using these tests as well, who needed the results. If they didn't have the result through, they couldn't potentially work that day. So actually we covered lots of the journeys of all the different, uh, different hospital and healthcare settings. We also had, as the time progressed, different areas, national booking, the app, the general public could use them as well. So uh, what I'm going to do now is hand over to Christina to go through how we put all this together. Fantastic, thank, thank, thank you, Angie. So uh, yeah, the key question of given all of that amazing vision, how did we actually go about implementing it? So uh, for us as answer, it started in August, 2020. So a small team of us, um, that was two developers, one tech lead and one delivery lead, myself, uh, we joined uh, the existing um, ITOC team within NHS Digital, which was free go live of, of ITOC. So it was very early days. There was some program uh, staff there, service cells we were working with, tech ops, the team that were doing 24 seven monitoring already, um, and some plunk, uh, Splunk professional services and um, colleagues within NHS Digital. So Splunk had been identified as the tool of choice, as Andrew's mentioned. Uh, it's a really, if, if you aren't aware of Splunk already, it's a really powerful tool that ingests amazing amounts of uh, computer logs and machine data to make uh, powerful insights for uh, live services and helping organizations use, put their data into action and their strap lines, turn data into doing. And so initially for us, it was a, a three month statement of work. So we from mid August 2020 to mid November. And, and in advance of that, our team got up to speed uh, with the tool and with a specific element within Splunk called ITSI, IT Service Intelligence, which is what we were using to create this network of, of monitoring and alerting. Um, and we, we worked at that actually uh, once we'd got uh, rapidly up to speed with both the, the service area and the tool itself. There, was, there wasn't really much need for a, a proper discovery phase. That's because the requirement was really clear. As Andrew set out, it was to put in place real-time monitoring on the national testing journey. We had the tool in place, as I've just said, and we knew what we were trying to uh, build with the tool to replace some of the manual reports that were being used as a kind of interim monitoring that were giving the service cells sort of uh, 24 hours out of date uh, data. We wanted to bring that to real time. And also the operational processes around that monitoring and alerting was um, being put in place by the other work streams within ITOP. So our team, the, the ask on our team uh, initially was to come in and um, provide some of that technical expertise and delivery expertise to develop, develop and deliver the tooling to support um, this ITOC vision. So like any good uh, team would hit the ground running, we set up, set up our ways of working. So we set up our stand-ups with our dev team and a, a blended, blended team. We set up our backlog in JIRA, in the NHS Digital JIRA. Um, and we actually joined the kind of sprint cycles that were already in place um, within the ITOC. We had a backlog um, and the backlog was uh, basically the uh, the end-to-end -end testing journey. This is a, um, a view of what that looked like back in the summer of 2020. So that takes everything from uh, the, the left-hand side where a user, uh, a citizen, sorry, um, decides that they need a test or they get referred by their employer right through to the end where they've got their, their test result. It's been uh, matched back with their registration. They've been notified and that data has, um, has gone on and, and been used downstream so to update the patient record, for example. We already had stakeholders identified as well. That's partly, again, why we didn't need to do a, a, a de sort of defined discovery phase. Um, we knew exactly which suppliers were delivering each of these sub-services. We already had contact, or NHS Digital already had contact with those suppliers for us to work with. So I think when we were diving in, unspokenly, the kind of what we, what we were all thinking was, how hard can it be? You know, we'll, we'll get this done. Simple, simple app. And um, now, <laughs> Inevitably, you can, you can imagine, it didn't quite turn out like that. So um, there were some hard yards along the way and some challenges that we had to overcome. And I'm going to talk about four of the key challenges um, next. So the first challenge was that uh, the, it was a small team and a really big ask. So as I've said, there was only a few of us um, in this kind of uh, the kernel of the ITOP team in um, the summer of 2020. But uh, we, some, we realized once we got under the hood that actually the scope was a lot bigger. So again, like any good Agile team, we defined an MVP. So we focused on actually the latter part of the testing journey where there was more 
um, risk of losing data between suppliers. So where data was being transferred between multiple suppliers doing different elements of this journey. Um, and that latter part of the journey focused a lot around um, the data processing service, DPS, within NHS Digital. So the flows in and out of DPS were, were our main focus. That was because that was the riskiest area. The earlier parts of the journey, actually, Deloitte had quite a, um, a monopoly on, on those elements, and they were doing lots of their own monitoring and alerting. So there was a kind of trust element there. We knew eventually we wanted to do it all, but that's what we focused on um, to start with. So we were looking at the count of records being sent from system A to system B, the frequency with which those, um, those data flows were happening, and alerting to when those flows seemed to be not quite um, doing what they should, or the count of records weren't matching up. So we managed our scope, that's the first thing. We also identified gaps in our speci specialist roles. So we weren't able to fix this before MVPs. We had the first six weeks of our engagement was delivering the MVP for ITOP launch, which was in early October. And once we'd done that, we kind of took stock a little bit and realized that we had some gaps. So we brought on board um, a business analyst, that was our lovely Kate, who you saw earlier. Um, and we also realized that actually the delivery lead role was a lot bigger than just a single person. There was an external facing element to it of ma managing the suppliers and engaging with stakeholders, and then an internal element of looking after the dev team. So we uh, brought on board a scrum master um, to split that role in two. We also recognized that actually Splunk is a really complicated and um, amazing tool with its own um, professional kind of accreditation system and, and training system. So if you have a look at Splunk's website, and you'll see they've got uh, accreditation pathways. For, um, yeah, there's loads of courses that you can do. You can become a certified admin or an architect or a consultant. And so we needed to have a range of these skills to make sure that we could use the tool to its full potential. So we partnered with a company down in Bristol called Apto, um, who got loads of great, um, great Splunk developers. Um, and that meant that we could fill in some of the, the gaps in those specialist roles. So still working with the Splunk professional services, and consultants who are kind of provided by, by Splunk uh, globally. So that's been a really positive partnership for us between Axa Digital, Acto, uh, and NHS Digital. And over time, we expanded the team actually from uh, four people through to, it was about 20, I think, at, at our maximum. And um, so we have multiple people filling each role. So we have multiple VAs, multiple uh, tech leads and, and Splunk architects, devs, uh, tester, delivery leads, and um, you name it, we, we probably have it. So if not rocket science, we, we solved our first challenge by managing the scope and by getting the right people in with the right skills. So our second challenge was that actually monitoring turns out is a lot more complicated than we first thought. And um, so there's a lot more going on actually once, once we started to dig into the architecture and the data flows and the logs behind all of the, these services in the end-to-end -end, uh, testing journey we realized actually there's an endless number of KPIs and alerts and reports that we could generate. And the question was, how do we know what's going to be most useful? We could monitor the infrastructure. We could monitor the systems themselves. We could monitor as a, at a business level and, and look at the trans number of transactions and orders being placed or results being matched. We could look at the data flows. We could do counts of errors or um, successes or you name it, we, we could do it if the data was in the logs. So it was really complicated. There was a lot going on. And it was also complicated because the, uh, the tender process to, to develop this NTS uh, national testing service journey was put together very quickly at the start of the pandemic. The contract tender process was uh, accelerated. There were lots of suppliers doing different elements within this journey. And that led to complexity and lots of boundaries between suppliers. It also grew and evolved over time. So this is version two from uh, the summer of 2020. And remember, this is just the high level. This is the most high level version of, of the end-to-end -end journey. Each one of these boxes has any number of, of uh, complexity and, and diagrams that behind it. And by October, we were at version nine and you can see there's more boxes, more things going on. And by March this year, we were actually at version 17 because of the complexity. So that that evolution was of things like different referral routes coming on board. So instead of just being able to be referred by yourself and um, through the self-referral portal or by your employer, there was routes for you to get um, tests if you were in a care home or in a prison um, or getting elective, elective care surgery and getting a test for that. 
Also, it's hard to remember, but there was a time before LFTs. So, um, yeah, PCRs were the, the start of the pandemic. There was just PCR testing, and then obviously LFTs and mass testing came into place. Loads more monitoring to do as part of that. And that's just two of the examples. So what we did to manage this was to put in place a product owner for this journey who became our go-to person to understand all the complexity, all the changes that were coming down the line. And that really helped to protect the team from um, having to kind of deal with this volatility. We had one person to go to and they kept us up to date. So thanks, Pete. Um, you've been great. And um, the other problem in terms of the complexity, there was more going on under the hood. And that meant that our stakeholders were really busy. So our service cells, the service cell we were working with to help keep the lights on with this journey, were busy managing the real incidents and managing the service, managing the suppliers. The suppliers themselves were busy delivering the actual service. And um, so we had to work at kind of getting protected time with these people and building really positive relationships so that even though they were busy, they could spend a bit of time working with us to help get the monitoring in place. They were also sometimes a little bit cagey. So um, even though at the start we, we knew exactly who to speak to at each of these uh, suppliers, the actual the mandate uh, wasn't quite clear and hadn't quite landed. So sometimes we'd be on calls with suppliers saying, and they'd be saying to us, why should we give you our logs? What, you know, this, is, this is our IP and you know, what, what, why are you monitoring our system? We do that ourselves, thank you very much. So we had to really get our senior stakeholders in from ITOC to help unlock those, uh, those conversations. And, and help us to, to get the engagement that we needed. There was also, surprise, surprise, some unclear requirements. So although the overall requirement was very clear, the actual um, way of how are we gonna monitor what healthy looked like was slightly unclear. So it was a new service, volumes were changing all the time, new bits were being added. And actually that made it quite hard to tell how we were gonna know whether a service was healthy or not. So we got around this by creating initial dashboards. So like this dashboard on the left-hand side or the, the snapshot of it, what we did was ingested the, the logs from these suppliers, then did some visualization to show um, the service teams what was going on, what usage was like, when it was peaking and, and dropping. And that helped then us to loop back around and iterate the monitoring later on and, and put the KPIs and alerts in place once they got to grips with actually what, what a normal service looked like. So, uh, yeah, we dealt with that through doing some dashboarding and visualizations. And also because of the complexity, there were specific sign-off steps needed, unique sign-off steps that were um, needed to agree and, and design the monitoring with our stakeholders. So, for example, we needed to make sure our product owner thought that our proposed requirements made sense. The service cell themselves were happy to be alerted when percentage of errors got above 5% or 10%. We needed the suppliers to be happy as well because it was their systems that we were monitoring and they were going to be the ones called out overnight as sort of level three, level four support. And so we took time out after MVP to develop what we called our pipeline process or the onboarding process, which is basically takes us from an, an initial requirement through analysis and data onboarding, getting the logs into Splunk, understanding what the requirement needs to be into, um, into our dev team, getting things built and then out to live. So for us, this kind of allowed the first part, the elaboration process, it means really understanding what are we monitoring? Why are we monitoring it? How are we monitoring it? Is it business health? Is it traffic through a system? Is, it, is there an API involved? Are there S3 buckets? What, what's the architecture and how are we gonna tell whether it's healthy or not? So it was really valuable for us to take that time out, having understood the, um, the challenges and then design a process that really worked for us. So this is a more detailed uh, version of, of that kind of end-to-end -end diagram. So the, the top row is our elaboration process, and that takes everything from a, a, an initial requirement where someone's just said, can you monitor system X, right through to understanding what our devs are going to have to build. And then the bottom row is the, the, the dev process, and then handing that monitoring over to live services, making sure we've agreed who's going to do what when um, things go wrong. So that was our second problem. Um, and just before I move on, it, it's worth noting that whatever you're working on, there will be complexities. I'm sure you're um, eminently familiar with them, but it's worth knowing, you know, what is it that's making my thing really complicated and, and trying to um, distill that down so that you can then uh, take action to address some of those complexities, because everything's complicated, eventually, other than making the complicated. And 
So our third challenge was that priorities constantly shifted. So it was a national pandemic response, and it was quite volatile. The things, the, the prevailing wind changed whenever anybody from the government stood up and made an announcement, which was basically every day yeah. um, in those briefings. So that was things like the borders opening up and doing testing at ports, or eligibility requirements changing for who could be uh, able to, to sort of self-refer or how the kind of queuing system was going to work when capacity was limited. And about variants of concern, it's hard to remember a time before, um, you know, Omicron's kind of the, the, the current uh, thing, but there was Delta before that, there was loads of others. And how do we alert to these, these variants of concern coming through? So the government announcements then changed our monitoring priorities, but they also meant that suppliers had limited capacity because they were reacting to these announcements and delivering the actual service. So they weren't focused primarily on sending the logs in Splunk to us, and we really wanted them. And um, you can guess which took, you know, took a back seat. They were busy delivering you know, the service for Matt Hancock. And it was when Matt Hancock was still health minister, which shows how long ago it was. Um, so the, the real success story is that actually, even though they had limited capacity, we did manage to get suppliers, all suppliers to engage with us and to deliver us logs in various forms. Splunk is really uh, versatile in terms of the data it can ingest, whether it's that's data that's pushed or pulled into or um, yeah, into Splunk or uh, pushed or pulled. Different ingestion routes to suit the different data that's, uh, that systems generate. So whether that's AWS logs or pulling it in via HEC or Firehose or raw JSON. We even scrape data from uh, CSV files that are dumped into S3 buckets or CSVs that are even sent to us by, by email. So, However, the suppliers could get data to us, we had ways to ingest that. Uh, however, they did have limited capacity for us, and that was, a, that was a bit of a challenge. The other thing to do with priorities constantly changing was that we actually, even though the vision was always to be proactive and to be um, looking at putting remedial action in place when we see a service degrading and to prevent HSSIs, actually, inevitably, we were reactive to the incidents that were happening. So we were reactive to the changes in the end-to-end -end journey, but also reactive to live incidents that may or may not have hit the headline got on the front page of the BBC. So inevitably, when something went wrong, the question turned to us and said, you know, pe people would say, well, I thought we had live service monitoring on this. I thought, I thought ITOC was, you know, had real-time monitoring. Why didn't we pick this up? Why wasn't this visible? And so inevitably, it was a bit of a game of whack-a-mole. Um, a, a problem would raise its head, and we'd all gather around and say, why didn't we see this? OK, maybe it was out of our scope. Maybe it wasn't in the logs. Maybe we had the logs, but we didn't have a KPI. And we'd run around and try and address that gap. And inevitably, the next problem would come up somewhere we least expected it. So whack-a-mole became the, the theme of the day. So we addressed that problem by building in flexibility. We moved from sprints to Kanban because sprints weren't serving our purpose anymore. We were really struggling to get um, a, a sort of clear run for, for a couple of weeks. So Kanban allowed us to pivot really quickly when priorities changed. And um, it also allowed us to do a continuous go live process. So whenever we had KPIs or dashboards ready to go live, we could put them out as long as um, our stakeholders were, were happy with them. We didn't have to wait until the end of a sprint for a single release. And it also meant that once we put monitoring live, we had a route for um, quick, a quick way to address any tweaks and improvements to that monitoring. And obviously, the more we had live, the more tweaks and, and requests we had to you know, change this threshold up or down or change this alert recipient. So it allowed us to be really flexible for those as well. Now, obviously, we didn't want to change priorities daily, and that didn't give the dev team you know, enough uh, time and focus to, to really get some momentum. However, we did review them at least weekly. And, and we reviewed them at two key parts in our um, in our end to end process. So when we moved from Scrum to Kanban, uh, both the, uh, the very initial backlog stage of like really high level requests, and at the stage where we have tickets ready for our dev team to build, we did weekly priority reviews with our product owner and with Andrew, head of ITOC, about which bits we were going to um, address next. We also kept in our sprint ceremonies because they were really helpful for our team dynamics and, and making sure we were working effectively together. So we still had stand-ups, still had fortnightly retrospectives, weekly show and tells, um, and that was really helpful. We brought new tickets into the devs, dev team on a Monday primarily, so they had a view of what they were going to work on that week, but we could also shift and pivot when needed. So if you need some flex in your process, um, I would thoroughly recommend weighing up when you need to move from Scrum to Kanban. 
So our fourth challenge um, was that elaboration process was really unpredictable. We did not have a lovely smooth conveyor belt of apples um, coming out re ready for go live. Um, we had famine and feasts, and that was really difficult to manage with our, our team and the growing, growing team in terms of, of numbers of people. So that was because we had the complexity I've talked about, we had changing, changing priorities, as I've mentioned, and also we were really dependent on suppliers giving us logs. We couldn't do any monitoring without those raw logs. So that led to some glitches in our um, in our end-to-end -end process in the conveyor belt. So we had work you know, that we expected to be ready for devs that then wasn't because we didn't have the logs, or we had work that we thought we were gonna work on and then it went on the back burner because there was another priority to focus on. So focus was, was kind of constantly shifting and um, that engagement and elaboration process. Sometimes we'd think it would take a couple of weeks or a, a certain amount of time and actually the supplier was busy working on something else and they couldn't get to us until their next sprint. Also, not all monitoring is the same. So although we have some things that we could kind of take off the shelf and say, right, we know how to monitor an API. Like we've got a set of KPIs that we'll do for that. We know what we're going to do. Other bits were much more unique and there wasn't always a template we could use. And it took a lot of engagement and, and collaboration to work out how we would um, make sure that the service was healthy. So the kind of standard elaboration process we started with was having a single team designated at, you know, at the bottom there, single team that spanned everything from the new ideas, spending some time each sprint elaborating them and, and refining them, getting the, the logs, and then um, some effort developing them and then getting them out to live. That single funnel of, of elaboration through to development. But what we actually needed, and um, we kind of re-envisaged that whole process and restructured our team to have concurrent elaboration process. And that was because of the amount of focus and engagement and the time needed, um, not to mention the specialist roles to ingest those logs into Splunk. We really needed to have focused squads of people working on um, between sort of six to 10 epics each squad would focus on. They wouldn't worry about all of the other ones of that, those six to 10 that, that they were working on. Some of them would come to pass, some of them wouldn't, and that um, uncertainty was spread over um, between two and four different squads we had working. So this shows three funnels going into the development team. Sometimes that was four, sometimes it's two. So that helped to spread out our uncertainty, deal with that volatility. Um, but what we did do was keep the development team which was then a team of sort of between seven and nine with a scrum master. They picked up work from all of the uh, what we call collaboration squads or engagement squads. And that meant that the devs were never siloed. There was no, never kind of knowledge that was um, you know, locked in, in one single person's head. And also it meant that the dev team together could pivot to where most effort was needed. So that was really transformative for us. Um, and it helped to, to really manage our, our workflow. It also helped to manage our team dynamics because I'm sure we're all familiar with this kind of uh, concept of the bigger the team, the more interactions. And that's why the max, the kind of optimum number is um, for a scrum team of seven. Well, when we had a team of 20, that's obviously a lot more connections than even um, this bottom right one on the diagram. And so what we did was have squads um, of three people. So that was a, a delivery lead, a BA and a tech lead elaborating that those new requirements they could work really closely together build up good relationships with the suppliers and then they fed into a dev team that was much more nearer to the, the optimum number however we did all still operate as one team so our retros were all together and and our stand-ups were all together because actually there was a lot of um uh, yeah still a lot of interdependencies the engagement squads wouldn't just work at the start of the process they also picked stuff up at the end and helped helped new monitoring to go live and to agree those operational processes. So having sub teams really worked, but we didn't split into um, individual squads sort of completely di divorced from each other. So those were our four main challenges. There were others along the way as well, mm -hmm. but uh, many others. Um, but in terms of our reflections and kind of lessons learned, I've got four key things to pull out. So number one is that discovery is almost always needed. Um, looking back, it was quite foolish of us to think, oh, we don't need the discovery. We've got requirements, we've got tooling, we've got the team. Actually, we could have really benefited from really understanding the landscape a bit more. And, and it could have possibly solved some, some uh, hassle and heartache further down the line. But I would say that even if you didn't do a discovery up front, it's all it's better late than never. For us, we did it straight after to MVP and we continued learning and, and evolving as we went. So um, I would say do it in some form, even if it's not part of your statement of work. And um, it's really important. And that's something I'm going to take away from this engagement. 
Second one is to maximize your flexibility. So for us, that was about moving from uh, sprints to Kanban. That gave us the flexibility that we needed. And um, so again, if you're uh, struggling to get enough work for, for a sprint and thinking, why is this so hard week in, week out to get, get a sprint worth of work, maybe you need to maximize your flexibility by moving to Kanban or doing some kind of combined model. And um, thirdly, uh, adapt everything to suit your specifics. So although we, you know, there's many off the shelf things that we can, we can take a, a sort of standard agile delivery process or a standard approach to whatever you're doing, adapt everything to suit your specifics. So for us, that meant adapting JIRA and having specific fields within our um, ticket templates to help make sure we're getting all the right checks and collecting all the right information. We adapted our delivery process, we adapted our team structure, and that's just the top three. So think outside the box and um, don't be afraid to adapt things, take things off the shelf and change them to suit you and continue to do that. Because um, sometimes we, we'd have a, a way of working that suited us for a few months and then we'd need to change it again. Um, and then finally, trust is critical to success. So um, it is really obvious, but I think it's so key. And um, the ups and downs that we've had over the last two years and all those challenges that we've faced, and the reason we've been able to navigate them well is because of the trust that um, we have between the team and uh, and, and it's digital our clients. So um, you know the trust that we have in Andrew to have our back and um, pointing to him, he's, he's off screen. Um, the trust that we have in Andrew to kind of have our backs and and, and support us and, and unlock the doors that are needed and, and protect us where needed, but also the trust that he had in us that we're going to deliver a, a good service. And um, so yeah, as you're kind of trialing and failing and, and iterating, I think having that foundation of trust is really important. And for us, we we built that through honesty and openness and, and making sure that we're all just pulling in the same direction and, and building up that, that really good relationship between the um, consultant and the, and the client. And so for us, that's allowed us to, to deliver a really fantastic service for NHSD and, and it's been a, a real joy. So final bit from me and before I hand over to Andrew is where are we up to now? So to bring you up to date, so we began just by monitoring the uh, NTS journey, but we've grown in scope a lot since then. So um, along the way, other COVID services came on board. So vaccinations were in, uh, started in December 2020, I think. So we started monitoring that end-to-end -end journey. COVID pass became a thing when um, you could start going to nightclubs again and then going to sporting events, et cetera. We also expanded across other NHS digital services, which is always part of the vision for ITOC. And Andrew will talk a little bit more about that where it's going and so yeah we also started monitoring ourselves and um, so mon using Splunk to improve our own service so and um, one of our uh, some of our colleagues last week did a, an LDF talk on how we used Splunk to tell us when a log stream had fallen over or when an alert had failed and and we built up this and um, what we call meta monitoring where we, we use the tool to monitor ourselves and um, so if I just zoom out from the, that first diagram Andrew shared of, of some of the uh, KPIs that we've built in Splunk, um, each node on the left-hand side is a, a group of between, let's say, two and 30 KPIs, depending on the service. We, if we zoom out on the whole of the uh, national testing service, you can see all the different interconnected services. And then zooming out further, um, we've got other uh, what we call trees in, in Splunk that are doing uh, vaccinations or COVID pass. Um, or the care identity service or ambulance data set, whatever it is. And then if we zoom out, it's very hard to see on a small screen, but we've got a lot of different services. We've actually got um, 22 different areas, one of which is test, one of which is VAX. Um, and that's, um, yeah, different service areas that, that we're monitoring. Within that, uh, that 22, there are 306, over 360 individual nodes on that diagram each of which has KPIs behind them. So we've got over 2,400 alerts. And you can imagine the, the maintenance that's required to make sure that all the thresholds and, and alerting requirements are, are still up to date. Um, and then we've got about over 100 dashboards and visualizations. And just to show you the scale of what is going on behind the scenes, Splunk, we are ingesting over 12 terabytes of data daily to power these KPIs. So Splunk, yeah, as I said, a really powerful tool. Do have a look more online about what it can do and, and whether it's uh, right for your organization. And, and then finally, we've kind of seen the whole life cycle of, of the testing journey. So we've, we've come round full circle to see actually some elements of the testing journey being deprecated and hibernated. So I showed you that really complicated diagram. Well, actually some of those systems and, and services have now been um, put into hibernation because the pandemic's over. 
fingers crossed. Um, so we've kind of uh, been updating our monitoring to reflect that and, and seen it through right from uh, start to finish, which has been a real joy. It's been fantastic working uh, with Andrew and, and the ITOC team with the, the live service cells within Industry Digital who do a fab job behind the scenes, keeping the lights on and investigating the incidents. Uh, with tech op team, uh, tech ops team who are 24 seven monitors and all of the different people that we've worked with along the way. Um, so I'm going to hand back to Andrew now to tell us where what's happening next. Uh, thanks, Christina. Uh, just actually looking at it, sometimes you, I don't really appreciate how much we've done over the uh, last few years. And actually that journey from August through to getting the MVP, which went in on the 5th of October, was incredible. And the amount we've done so far is absolutely incredible as well. So we set out earlier, uh, do you want to go just so I can't do two things at once, so I've got Christina pressing the mouse. So we set out earlier, what well, we had a few things to do and where we are now. So what, what have we done? Well, actually, as you can see from the screenshots here, we've, we've put the infrastructure and the site in place. So what we have now in the Leeds offices for NHS Digital, we've got all of the screens uh, with the monitoring and alerting in front of the teams and the 24 by 7 monitoring teams sit behind them. Didn't want the photographs there, because normal techers. So they sit behind them in these desks watching this, not just for the alerts, for example. And then they behind them, we'll have the other teams that support them. So the service bridge teams and the service management team. So we put the infrastructure in place, the sites in place. We also, as I said earlier, and Christine's gone through in great detail, all of the onboarding, the monitoring, the alerting is all in place. So they're in already. So the ITOC now, the other bits we talked about, ITOC is now the strategic monitoring and alerting for NHS digital. Yeah, just go on, I think I'm yeah. I, I tend to talk without looking at something. Um, so ITOC is now the strategic for monitoring for uh, NHS digital. So we have one over parts of mind. Not all, but most. And we've got all, nearly all of the key services for NHS digital now in the ITOC. Uh, the skills we talked about earlier as well. So the teams that were doing the monitoring, particularly the tech ops ones, the 24 by 7, 365 team that would sit there looking at it and reacting to the alerting. We've retrained them. Oh, we've upskilled them rather than retrained. We've uh, trained them in AWS, in Splunk. Um, that means they can cover a lot more level two work as well. So adding to the value of the IT operations center. The service teams as well, we've moved just from a generic service management skill set, we've moved to a service integrated skill set, because as you saw, the national testing service journey is incredibly complicated and involved integrating lots of different components and suppliers to deliver that service. And as part of that, we've introduced a more proactive approach to them teams and they preempt incidents and proactive work towards the incidents. That is used as an example of when we set up the other team. So for example, what we put in place for the national testing service, we've also now reused because it went well, following iterations and lessons learned for the vaccination service integration teams. Um, I guess the key thing for all of this is, did, did we stop it? Did we prevent anything? Well, actually, yes, we did. So I'll give you a couple of examples. I'll go into too much detail, but for national testing service, we used to have a double the amount so double figures worth of incidents per month. Now that has dropped down to zero and one, but we can't just put all of that down to uh, you know me and my team's work. There's been a bit of less usage of it. But certainly in the early days, there was areas where we stopped high severity incidents. So to give you two quick examples, one to do with the PCR journeys, there was an element where early on in the PCR journeys, and you saw that length of data flow that Christina showed you, where if it would break as part of that journey, we could step in and get the data reflowing before it had any impact to the user. So to the general public or to whoever that was always going to, because in the middle of there, there was a matching element. So if that person had taken the result and that journey stopped, actually we had a little bit of time before the result came in from the lab, joined together and then through, through the rest of the journey to go out, we had that little bit of time to prevent a high severity incident. And that did happen on a number of occasions. We got the data flowing, in time to get into the matching area before the lab results came in and therefore uh, unsuspecting public never knew any different. The results came through in the same time. There's also another element on the PCR data flow element where there was a point where there was talk from a government perspective, another quite late introduction of uh, requirements as Christine has alluded to many times, where we had to pre-link. And by pre-linking, it was, well, we've sent this out and we need to join them together again. Now, there were some complications in that journey, 
but actually there was because of the monitoring and alerting early on in that journey we could see if there was problems in the uh, in the pre-linking journey and by seeing that the alert team coming up we get in touch with the suppliers that are involved by the service management integration teams and service bridge teams we would then get in touch with suppliers and we get the data reflowing and actually they would get reflowed before they went out the next day so basically that was all your pcr tests going out in the post again short time scales but by doing that quickly and early we prevented the highest very incidents so yes what we put in place did work um we do continue to learn from this and we've learned from our side as well we've found that those with such complicated journeys and so many journeys actually we were getting a lot of alerts there was no feedback loop in place from some of our service teams and some of the teams that were getting called out for it so actually we've implemented a service team for the itoc itself and put in the service reviews in place um let's move on to what's next so what's next uh, yeah go on to the next one oh right back on. yeah sorry it was my fault i didn't know where we're starting um so what's next well we've we've NHS Digital have got all the structures and processes and ways of working now in place with the help and the collaborative working we've learned from and with AMSA as part of this journey. So it's time for us as NHS Digital to end our journey with AMSA and pick it up ourselves now and move forward uh, with blended teams and take full ownership and take forward all of the elements we've learned and take it uh, forward. So it's gone very well. It, it, I'm absolutely uh, really. Um, taken aback by the amount Christina showed us because I forget quite how much we've done in the short time scale. So that's gone really well and we've set out what we wanted to do and it's been a great collaboration. Uh, and even though I tell them many times, there have been a couple of people who've been uh, really key to this, uh, Christina being one and Chris Neal being another, uh, great examples of uh, how we should work together. The next bits of the journey, well, I take that on board and we move forward as Answer Digital. So we've still got to on board a number of services, about another 30 of all the key platinum and gold services we have in NHS Digital. Now I'm committed to that, to our public board, that we will do that by the end of the financial year. And we're, we're on that journey and we're still on track with that plan. Also as well, we are, uh, we've got the merger coming. You know, you can't miss it in the news, NHS Digital, NHS England, our merger. I'll just say that with more opportunities. What can we do for NHS England? What services do they offer that we can help them with, that we can monitor and alert? Uh, and then there's just one other bit as well. And this is my vision. So on top of Pete's original vision, my vision is having worked in lots of different areas of healthcare. When I've worked in some, particularly in some of the secondary care areas and some of the acute areas, I have a vision that we could do, help out some of these secondary care trusts and some of these uh, trusts who don't have 24 by 7 monitoring and can't do it 365 days a year so what we could do is i could offer them almost like a service catalog we could do your monitoring and alerting overnight if you have an incident we could either go in as level two and fix it or we can call out your suppliers if needed basically we could offer services to the wider nhs and that's what i really think and would like to get to as part of what we're doing uh, we're running over slightly so i'll Finish there and ask, are there any questions? So, Kate, have we had any questions? Yeah. Um, just a reminder that the slider and the, the numbers at the bottom of the thing you can see on the slide, so please submit your questions. We've had one really pertinent for what you've just been through the next two. Uh, Andrew, two years to achieve the vision, see change of vision, mm -hmm. longer or quicker than you thought? Oh, well. I'll start by answering the first bit. I work quite answer it almost politician style. I think the first bit of delivering the August to October much quicker than I anticipated. I actually think what we put in place over two years is probably on track, maybe even quicker than I thought. It's definitely not behind where I thought. If you were to ask me again in April, that'll be the key because that's when we want all of the NHS digital platinum and gold services in one place strategically together. We NHS Digital originally had uh, another consultancy come in many years ago to say, can we move it all together? They estimated four to five years. So on that basis, we're well ahead of schedule. Excellent. And that was the only question we got. Oh, um, right, okay. But just a reminder that um, if you want to submit questions back to you, then uh, you can certainly let us know. Um, also, here's the slider. 
And just um, to highlight that AMSA are hosting some further events for the digital festival, which ends on Friday. So we've got a couple tomorrow, one Thursday and one Friday. Uh, we do welcome you there at those events. Yeah, quick plug for the Friday one. That's um, myself and some other colleagues talking about how AMSA does discovery. So I talked earlier about discovery is always needed. So do come along and hear about how we tackle the particular one earlier this year. It will be as fascinating as it was today, which has been a really great event. Thank you, guys. So um, that draws the event to a close. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, before we leave you, um, just a, a, a quick plug for Boycott Your Bed, which is an excellent fundraiser that AMSA participates in every year. It raises money for a charity called Action for Children. And uh, it gives us a taste of what it's like to sleep with on the streets. So. Uh, quite a number of AMSA people will be sleeping out in the main square on the 7th of October. Got the QR code there if you would like to contribute to this charity and answer double all donations. So um, any, any support would be much appreciated. And thank you for joining us today. And thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.